How couldst that mortal mixture of voices have breathed such divine enchantment and utterly entwined my soul? I was but a young man of thirty when first enraptured by that most perfect lady, Leonora Baroni, said by all to be a marvel of the world. On that first occasion, when I was blessed to hear her sing in their splendid villa at Rome, her immortal voice was entwined together with those of her sister, Caterina, and their mother, Adriana, all three delicately accompanying themselves on exotic instruments exquisitely played. Now, aged 64, with the deprivation of my sight, I am able to increase the sight of the mind within and to imagine my days in the Eternal City. On that evening, it was Leonora's beauty, her artistry, her style and refined manners, which were committed to my eternal memory. In 1638, I made a tour of Europe to increase my knowledge of the world and advance my literary reputation. But I had not an inkling that Rome would take my prisoned soul and land it in the lap of Elysium. Some time after hearing Leonora, I attended a private academy given by the eminent Cardinal Francesco Paberini. I was most honoured to accompany Lucas Holstenius, a man of immense learning, with the charge of the great Vatican Library. The Cardinal's residence was a newly built and most luxuriously appointed palace, situated on one of Rome's famed seven hills, and offering delightful gardens and a breathtaking perspective of the city. Academies were most popular with the Roman noblemen and other gentlemen devoted to philosophy. Ancient objects, curiosities, Egyptian mummies, sculptures, paintings, and even musical performances were parts of their private collections. At the Cardinal's Academy, several famed castrato singers from the Pope's own chapel performed sacred and moral music composed by Rome's leading musician, Domenico Mazzocchi. Musicians and conoscenti expounded upon the metabolic harmony of his compositions. I recall especially a magnificent musical sonnet which expounded upon the way that timepieces can measure out the stretch of a man's life. Indeed, it even inspired a verse that I used later in one of my own literary works. Death grinned horrible, a ghastly smile, to hear his famine should be filled. Oh, 
Another work, this time setting the words of the Passion of Our Lord with tears, tears and more tears, repulsed my Puritan sensibilities. I could only think of the founder of the Jesuit order, Ignatius of Loyola, whose spiritual practice advocated the daily shedding of tears. I may now be blind for the sake of poetry, he sacrificed his sight for the Lord. While I recovered from that popish overindulgence, my spirit was refreshed by a glittering and beguiling trio of singers who advised the listeners to flee life's false delights. Indeed, I did flee to Naples soon afterwards, remaining there until the winter of 1639. I returned to Rome at the start of Carnival, and just in time to attend the performance of an opera, Che Soffre Spiri, He Who Suffers Hopes, held at the Pope's own theatre. The poet was Giulio Rospigliosi, who later became himself Pope. The stories of his operas were based upon romantic epics, pastoral stories and narratives of martyrdom each one of them bearing some religious truth or moral lesson. I much preferred the oratorio, a kind of music not unlike opera, but without the staging, given during Lent and other religious holidays in the churches or oratories. Most of these oratorios were composed in two parts, divided by a sermon delivered by any one of Rome's most celebrated preachers, whose rhetoric would have made the Roman orator Quintilian stare and gasp. I recalled the persuasive preaching of Dean John Donne at St Paul's in London in my youth. The story of St Catherine, with music composed by Signor Marco Marazzoli, was told mainly in the recitativo, which is a sort of speech in music. Of the airs, Catherine had the lion's share. Her arias were exquisite. Caro Sposo, sung by the young martyr at the moment of her death, gently touched the inner chambers of my heart 
and melted my soul. Converted by her steadfastness and courage, a Roman soldier sang the visionary words, Abandon your earthly desires and treasure heaven above all else, echoed by an awe-inspiring final choir.
The most precious and enduring memory that I have is of an enchanting concert given by Leonora Baroni's trio at their private family villa. In attendance were cardinals, noblemen, men of learning and foreigners. The famed Parisian Monsieur André Mogat, a virtuoso player of the viol, was seated next to me. After the final trio, he whispered in my ear, this concert has transported me into such ravishment that I have forgotten my mortal condition and believe myself to be among the angels. In her own time, Leonora's mother had been a celebrated singer at the court in Mantua, together with that musical genius, Signor Claudio Monteverdi. That evening in Rome, this lady bowed the golden strings of her lyre in mournful harmony and sang to it a lament so persuasive that we believed her to be Queen Artemisia herself. Had that pitiful widow who drank her husband's ashes been alive in our enlightened Christian times, she would have been eternally damned for such a mortal sin. Another sort of lament, often performed in a private chapel within a palace or villa, was what might be called a religious soliloquy. On one occasion, Leonora portrayed Mary Magdalene at the foot of the cross. Seized by the cruel wonder of her saviour's death, she cursed the enemy, admitted her own guilt, and almost wept herself to death. Those bitter tears compelled the sun to hide, the winds to cease, and the rocks to weep. Leonora's singing carried us through what the Jesuits call imagination prayer, in which all the senses are drawn into that tragic scene to share the torment of the sorrowful penitent. Only a singer of such accomplishment as the great Leonora could so profoundly have touched every soul in that room and elevated our spirits to a state of 
transcendence. Some time ago, I began to compose a Latin epigram in praise of that divine lady. And at least in my mind, it is now completed. Ad Leonorum Romae Canentem. Each man, so the nations believe, is given a guardian angel with protective wings. Why marvel then, Leonora, if you have even a greater privilege? After all, the sound of your voice declares the presence of God. God, having left heaven, hides in your throat and slowly accustoms people to immortal sounds. If God is in all things and is everywhere, he still speaks only through you, while he remains silent in everyone else. I was returned to my senses when that sublime musician, Signor Luigi Rossi, handed Leonora and her sister the notes of a freshly composed duet describing the exquisite pain caused by a lover's beautiful eye. Imparadized by the musical wonders of the eternal city, I was disquieted by the thought of approaching war in England and my grave obligation to return home. Must I thus leave thee, O paradise? What can I expect from my idol? Alas, false hopes fly away. <laughs> 